guys. Good to see you this morning. If you wouldn't are able, please stand and I will lead us in prayer. So if you would, please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here together, Lord. And just please be with us today and help us to shout out to you and, and just lift your name up, Lord. Just please be with us. Please be with Brother Rick as he brings a message. And just please be with all those that couldn't be here today for whatever reason. All these things we ask your son's precious and holy name. When you found me, I was so blind My sin was before me I was swallowed by pride But out of the darkness You brought me to your light You showed me new mercy And opened up my eyes From the day you saved my soul Till the very moment when I come I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul With brilliant light is all around And endless joy is the only sound my heart forever now oh in your arms I'll always be found from the day you saved my soul till the very moment when I come home I'll sing I'll dance my heart will overflow the day you saved my soul My love is yours My heart is yours My life is yours Forever My love is yours Until the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul, you saved my soul Till the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul You saved my soul
It wasn't for nothing I just shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone Won't be shackled to the way I was Oh, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Gone Now my sin is dead and gone And I sing hallelujah Done, done. He is risen and he's done, and I sing hallelujah. Praise is a weapon I will overcome. Oh, I'm gonna shout like the battle's won. Fall back, devil, cause your time is up. Oh, I'm going to live like the stone is gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. Done, done. He is risen and is done, and I sing hallelujah.
I see redemption. Ravage the grave. The triumph of heaven. Christ Jesus our King. No wonder we call you Savior. No wonder we sing your praise. Jesus our hope forever. You made a way. You made a way. No wonder we call you Savior. No wonder we sing your praise. Jesus our hope forever. You made a way. You made a way. for coming. It's good to see each one of you. We love each one of you. Please greet each other and, and just say hi to each other. You may be seated.
the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like gold, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond thee, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, and with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Please bow your head with us. Father, we thank you for today, and Father, we thank you for the many blessings you have given us. Father, every one of us here in this building has been blessed beyond measure, Father. One way or another, we are all truly blessed. And all of these blessings, Father, come from you. Everything we have. And Father, we want to thank you, Father, for everything that you have given us. And Father, please just be with us, Father. In everything that goes on in our daily lives, Father, there are prayer or things we need for prayer that we don't tell anyone about, Father. And I would ask that you would just peel back our hearts, Father, and look into them. And Father, and know what we need, Father, and be with us and answer our prayers that, that we need. Father, we ask that you please be with Pastor Rick this morning as he brings the message. And Father, please let the Holy Spirit be with him because he cannot do it alone. Father, let us take that message with us into our hearts and then take it to the world. And Father, please let those that are in Christ this morning, let the Holy Spirit touch them and bring them to Christ so they may know their Lord and Savior that brings them salvation and everlasting life through His blood. And Father, I, I ask that you would be with those that are sick this morning and suffering, Father. Please be with them and give them grace and mercies and blessings. And Father, I ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christian Ethics class will meet Tuesday morning, June 1st at 10. The Young and Heart will meet Wednesday, June 2nd at 11 a.m. with a potluck meal at noon. RHGA's Mission Friends Youth Swag and Adult Bible Study will be Wednesday evening, June 2nd at 7. Our Breakfast Fellowship will be next Sunday, June 6th at 9.30 a.m. Cheryl will see you picking up the notes, milk, chocolate milk, and juice. The latest Bible study group will begin a new study in June. The author is Elizabeth George, and the book is in, is in the A Woman After God's Own Heart series. It is a study over the book of James, and the title is Growing in Wisdom of Faith. Books should cost around $10. Please let Glenda know as soon as possible if you would like to. The men's Whetstone Ministry will meet Saturday morning, June 5th at 7. Man of Monday is June 7th at 7 p.m. Please be in prayer for this event and support it financially. Our speaker is Van Morris. Encourage and invite men to attend this event. There is a holiday world trip planned. Of June, on Saturday, June 26th, if we can get discount tickets for a group of 15 or more, please make plans to come and enjoy the day. There is 
sign up sheet in the foyer and in the fellowship hall for anyone that wants to go. During the month of May, we will be collecting bar soap, washcloths, toothbrushes, and bath tools for Operation Christmas Child. Bless you. Bless you. The food pantry is in need of the following items. Toilet paper, crackers, any kind, spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti sauce, macaroni and cheese, Alfredo or cheese sauce, dried or canned beans, flour, soup, canned carrots, mixed vegetables, peas, carrots, sweet potatoes, canned fruit, peanut butter, and jelly, and personal hygiene products. Donations appreciated. Bless you. From, from anyone who has a surplus of fresh garden vegetables or eggs, any donations are greatly appreciated. Volunteers are needed to the help to help on the third Saturday morning of each month at 10. And there's a great big happy birthday to Mary and French June 4th. Uh, real quick, uh, vacation Bible school is fast approaching. It will be July 12th or 16th at 7 to 9.30 p.m. We have been blessed with many volunteers to leave and to help, but we are still in need of a leader for the nursery class and possibly a man and woman to help with the driving of the van. If you would like to volunteer in any way, please contact Monty French or Cheryl Dell. Monetary donations are being accepted for snacks. You may give your donation to the non Glenn or Fonda French or designate your check for the donation to go to DBS Snacks. Monetary donations are being accepted for school supplies. You may give your donations to Melanie French or designate on your check for the donation to go to DBS school supplies. During vacation Bible school, many children and youth have heard the good news of Jesus Christ and have been saved. Please be in prayer that this will happen this year and please pray for vacation Bible school. In our New City Catechism question, what is the Lord's Supper? Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of Him and His death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to be doing children's talk if the children would like to come up. Come on, Dad. <laughs> because I've got so much to remember I had to write it down. You know what's special about this weekend? It's Memorial Day weekend. <clears throat> That's why I brought the flags out here for us to look at this morning. I'm going to talk to you all about those flags. It says, can you tell me what is the same about the flags? What's the same about our flags here? Can you tell me? They're, they both have red, white, and blue on them, don't they? Comparing of the flags, because mm -hmm. they are they are in front of the church, so they must be important. The U.S. flag, the red, stands for valor and hardiness. On the Christian flag, the red represents blood. And the U.S. flag, the blue stands for, for perseverance and justice. On the Christian flag, it stands for the faithfulness, truth, and sincerity. On the U.S. flag, the white stands for purity. The Christian flag, it represents purity and peace. So each of the colors represents something, and they are very similar, 
The U.S. flag has 13 stripes on it that represents the 13 colonies, and currently it has 50 stars on it, the little white stars, to represent the 50 states. The Christian flag has a cross on it. Did you see the cross on it, the flag, the red? And it represents the cross that Christ died on. So they are similar, but here is something that's kind of cool. The Christian flag can be flown and pledged to any country. It doesn't matter where you go. If you go to Russia, Asia, China, Europe, anywhere you go, you can pledge to the Christian flag. Anywhere in the world. But the U.S. flag, only those who live in the U.S. would pledge to the U.S. flag. So the Christian flag is a world flag, where the U.S. flag is a country flag. But we are talking about Memorial Day, and we know that we have had soldiers die for the U.S. flag. But we should, should remember when we look at the Christian flag. Who should we remember when we look at the Christian flag? Jesus, who died for our freedom from sin and hell. So when you look at the front of the church, which flag would you think would be the most important? Would it be the U.S. flag or the Christian flag? It would be the Christian flag. So this weekend, take time to remember all those who gave their lives for you, our soldiers and Jesus Christ himself. I've got two Bible verses this morning to look at. The first one is John chapter 15, verse 13. It says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what our soldiers did, and that's what Jesus did too. They laid down their lives for us. And the second one is the book of John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him may be saved. So as we celebrate this Memorial Day weekend, let's remember our soldiers that died for us, but also let's remember Jesus that died on the cross for us. Let's take away our sins. Can we say a prayer? Dear Lord, thank you again for allowing us to come to church. I pray, Lord, to be with each one that's here. Be with us at each one that's at the end of the world. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Keep us safe. Always be with us our family. Good morning. Let me ask you first to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew 26. We're going to look at verses 36 to 46. I'll give you just a minute to turn there. We have some other things to take care of before we actually get to the, that portion of our service. <clears throat> I remember when I graduated high school and um, in the church I was... I was at then, having to walk up front, I, I leaned over and told Zach, I said, look, I, I won't make you make the walk of shame, I'll let you stand there. So, um, Zach, if you would stand up, he's, he just graduated, so let, let's applaud him and say congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Zach. <clears throat> I would have appreciated if my pastor had taken the time to say, look, just stay there and I won't make you walk up there. But, so when I thought about it, I thought, well, I'll do him that favor. <clears throat> Michael asked you that question, what is the Lord's Supper? This has been a place of disagreement within the church for years. And it's not likely to be settled in our lifetime. But of the three, of the three larger choices considered, there's really only one that makes sense. And uh, when it says, what, what is the Lord's Supper? It's the Lord's presence with you spiritually. He's not in the bread and the wine as in his blood and body are divided up and somehow mystically these materials are, are made blood and wine instead of, or, or 
blood and body versus wine and, and bread or grape juice in the case of your Baptist. They, uh, they don't transform from one to the other. They are symbolic. And yet most theologians would come down on the side, or at least those that are solid, would come down on the side that Christ is in fact here spiritually to bless you. Now when we take it, we're not only looking backward, which is usually the way we think of it, because we'll look in our table of remembrance and it says, do this in remembrance of me. So we always think of backwards. It's only 50% backwards and 50% forward. Because when we take up the Lord's Supper, what we're doing is we're looking back at what Christ has done, and it's the promise of his return. If you only look backwards, you've missed part of it. It's like having the first part of a meal and then leaving and going somewhere else. So that, that meal, when we take it together, the Lord's Supper, it is remembrance of what Christ has done, the body offered up, the blood shed, but also the promise of God through Christ. I will come back for you. And we will do this again in, in my Father's kingdom. So when it says, what is the Lord's Supper? The answer given in the new city is, Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates today when we will eat it, eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. So. <clears throat> now, I'll ask if Matthew would put up the statement of Christology. And while he's doing that, I want to... It's good to see uh, some of you I haven't seen for a while. And I, I've been asking, and I'll ask again this week. I want you to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's an assumption of the New Testament that if you're part of the church, you'll be, you'll be praying for them regularly anyway. The one another's in the New Testament show not only an obligation. <clears throat> now, obligation is a word sometimes we look at in a, in a disfavorable way. Not only an obligation, but the opportunity to bless one another by praying for each other. So what I'm asking is, will you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ on a, on a daily basis? Now, when I pray, I, I pray through, and, and if you have a typical seat, basically what I do is in my mind, I wander through, and I pray for you as I move through the room in my head. <clears throat> and I try to pray that way for everyone. First service, second service, wherever it is you normally sit. That's why I, I know some people act like we have assigned seating. We really don't. But it does, in fact, make my prayers for you easier. But let me ask you to commit to praying for one another. It's not only a mandate. It's a blessing to know that your brothers and sisters not only care enough for you to love you, but they love you so much they pray for you. That, that's the understanding of the New Testament of who the church is. Now, that statement of Christology, and again, we read this. We read this together as a body of Christ as a means of confessing who we know Jesus to be by virtue of the scripture. Many people arrive at a place where they decide, well, this is who Jesus is for me. Well, let me, let me just give you a quick illustration of that. If someone came to you and described you in a way which is utterly not who you are, would you be bothered by that? Right? They, they describe somebody that's not you, and they say, well, that's who I think you are. And you're like... Well, that's nonsense. Well, Jesus is the same. He is who he says he is by means of the, the recorded word, which is the Bible. And when we take that and pollute it by virtue of our imagination, imagination is great. Imagination is a wonderful tool. I'm going to ask you to use it here in a little bit. It's not okay when you defy the word of God. It's not okay to arrive at a, a conclusion. In fact, the, the, the scripture actually picks that up and says, no scripture is of private interpretation. We are not free to formulate our own Christ. He is spoken to plainly throughout the entire of the, of, of the Bible, not just the New Testament. He's spoken of many times in the Old Testament. So we arrive at a place by virtue of the scriptures, never without them. And that's what this, this statement of Christology is. It, it, takes, it takes all that we've, we have reported to us in the scriptures and gives it to us uh, in a way that we can memorize, and this is an act of worship as we read it together. The church has done, done this for 2,000 years now. Not this particular statement of Christology, but they have oftentimes spoken back to one another in a way of confessing. And um, 
it, it's, it's a glorious part of our worship. So let's read together this statement of Christology. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh, and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. And thank you for that. <clears throat> now, please go with me to Matthew 26. There's a bit of an introduction I have to do to get us ready for this Garden of Gethsemane. Now, you may have in your mind a picture, maybe arrived at some, some picture that was in your, in my head, I have many of different ones. There's, a, there's the one that we've all seen, the red-headed Jesus, which simply couldn't have been him. The, the long-haired, mullet-wearing Jesus with a beard, leaning upon a rock, looking at the sky, with the palest skin I've ever seen, nearly translucent. He simply couldn't have been that, physically anyway. But whatever picture you arrive at, understand that our struggle with whether or not he's redheaded and pale skinned or, or something else is, is part of the struggle that goes on because as we, as we struggle with the idea of God putting on flesh amongst us, it's not new. In fact, into the world that Jesus, in, in fact, was introduced, the world in which he walked around for his 30 some odd years of life, it, he was troubling. He was troubling because many in the Greek world in particular could not understand that God could put on material flesh and walk amongst people. In fact, they were, they were more comfortable with the death, burial, and resurrection than they were the incarnation. How is it the immaterial God that we all know reigns and rules sovereignly? How could he put on flesh? Because they looked at flesh in a way that the Bible doesn't. And I tell you that many of us make a similar, not, not the exact same mistake, but a similar mistake. It's actually called docetism. And it's the idea that, the, that, that Jesus walked around, but he didn't really have physical flesh. It was more of a, an illusion, a presence that people saw, but he wasn't really real. You, 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 you would see him, but he didn't put on flesh because their problem was all things physical were looked down upon. Now, we still struggle, and this is not entirely resolved. The church rejected docetism and anything like it years and years ago. So it's a heretical view. We understand that based upon the New Testament, which says this truth we handled, talked about touching Jesus. Jesus in his resurrected body says, touch me, see, right? He's speaking of a physical body. He had a physical body. He was resurrected a physical body. He's not just spirit, he's body and spirit. Having said that, there is still a bit of a problem. Jesus has two natures. He is unique. No one like him. He has a divine and a human nature. His divine nature is from everlasting to everlasting. His human nature has a birth date. He comes into, the, comes into existence in his human nature. Let me give you some language that theologians use. As touching, and then you so would say as divine, or as touching is human nature. When it comes to that, it's easy to think about if, we, if, we're, if we're just going to take the time to do it. When Jesus sweat, did his divine nature sweat? I'm sure he sweat. No, he only sweat in his human nature. When Jesus slept, did his divine nature sleep? Well, the testimony of Scripture is that he never sleeps nor slumbers. So it's his, it's his human nature. Now, what we have to do, and it, this is... The, this is the great work of the theologian, the, the, the Christian theologian, is to take these two natures 
and to do what every, what every good church council has determined to do and what every good Christian should do is to take these two natures and put them together without mingling them. Because if you mingle or mix them, you come up with a hybrid. Jesus is not a hybrid. He has two natures, fully man and fully God is the confession. Fully man, his human nature is a true human nature. Fully God, not some kind of demigod or semi-god or some other sort of formulation that men might do, but instead he is the everlasting taken on flesh. And really that word in the New Testament is he's pitched his tent in our presence. He, he's put on his, he's taken on humanity. Philippians 2 is very helpful here as well. But you, you look at it, what we have in the person of Christ is a unique occurrence. This is God who is from everlasting, who cannot cease to exist because if he does, if God blinks, we're all toast. We're done. We're gone. If God blinks, if, if, if God nods off because he holds together all, all of the created order by the word of his power, if he blinks, we're done. We are no more. If he nods, we are no more. You are sustained continuously by the divine. The immaterial divine holds together material world by his power, by the word of his power, by the strength that he possesses to do so. So it's all this that is forced into this prayer. So when we look at this prayer in Gethsemane, what we have here is the divine wrapped in and i got to be careful about even the verbiage I use, taken on in the incarnation flesh, humanity, that is true humanity. So what we're going to see here is his divine nature at no point wavers. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are never at any point in disagreement. The divine trinity. The Son is not trying to convince the Father to do something he never wanted to do. But Father, Son, Holy Spirit in perfect concert, never at any point in disagreement. There are three persons, one substance, that's the divine or God. And those three persons in the, in the Godhead, in the Trinity, are, are never at odds with one another. Perfect unison. Always, always believing, understanding, and working towards the same end. Now the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinctive in their roles in salvation. And yet they're not trying to... They're, there's this odd thing that many in the church today do. They have the son at war with the father almost. Well, father, you can't kick him out. He's one of mine. Well, are you sure? They know exactly who theirs are. There's no doubt, no confusion, no, no, no uh, disagreement inside the Godhead. <clears throat> that has to do with the divine nature. Now, the human nature of Christ in this garden doesn't know everything. Jesus occasionally says something that is well, it's bothersome to people like myself. I don't know the hour of my return. But you can see in the men, when you look out of the inside of the camp and you look out and you see Peter and, and the rooster has just crowed a third time, you look into him, not just at him. Jesus knows within men. So there's a bit of leakage, if you will, that because this divine nature is in this union with the human nature, there are times Jesus knows more than he should, and other times you'd, you'd wish he knew more than he did. And it's confusing. The confusion's all on our side, guys. It's never on God's side. You and I, being what we are, flawed, limited, small, fearfully and wonderfully made, frail, all those things trying to look at the immensity of infinity and going, I see it, and we do. But it's like trying to put your hands around the globe and say, I've got it, right? You can't. It's too great for me, says the psalmist. It's too high for me. And if we have any sense, we'll agree with him. Because if not, I'll, we'll find you someday sitting in the corner somewhere, babbling and, and blowing spit bubbles trying to figure it out. Because it will simply be more than you can comprehend and we should be okay with that. In my later years of my life, in, in the, last, the last 10, I've become comfortable with something that used to just absolutely drive me out of my mind, the idea of mystery. 
And that came down to the more I studied, the more I realized, you know almost nothing. <laughs> and that's been the testimony of Scripture, and it's been a testimony of time for a long time. That the further we press in, the, the more we realize, man, I've only scratched the surface. I'm barely in at all. And that's just the truth of the human condition. In this life, you and I, as we sojourn, know just a little. It reminds me of a friend of mine who got his second belt in karate, decided he was going to be kung fu at that moment, and was delivered a thorough beating by someone who had no, no belt at all. He knew just enough to be beat severely. And we know just enough to get ourselves in a great deal of trouble, so be careful what you do with your knowledge. But in this passage, we do not have God wavering. I have to nail that down for you right now. This is not God going, oh, is there plan B? God has only had one ever plan, and that was Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Before he formed Adam, before he said, let there be light, within the council of the Trinity, it had already been determined that Christ would die. Though Adam had not even been formed yet. The gospel was in place within the mind of God and therefore could not not be. That's the determination of God. It can't not be. And yet when God, in the person of Christ, in the incarnation, when he goes into the garden and his anxiety is real, his sorrow is true, don't, don't take his, his feelings in the, in the garden and diminish them and say, well, he's divine. And these are, he's really just sweating these, these, great blots, these great drops of blood. And he's, he's perspiring in this way because he's trying to be dramatic for, his, for his, three, his three friends, Peter, James, and John. Which would make him play acting and pretending and therefore lying. We cannot have a lying savior. <clears throat> There's some great theologians through the years that have taken great work and really screwed it up by saying things, well, there are times where Jesus accommodates you and me. When he says, I don't know my, the return of my, the, the time of my return, he's really accommodating because it's over their heads. So he just, he, he, he essentially tells something, not the truth. If he does that, be weary of that. Because if he does, you and I have a salvation that won't work. It won't deliver you. So when the psalmist asks, who shall ascend to the the, the hill of the most high it would be not us because our savior is flawed and you and i can't we can't go to heaven by means of the work of a flawed savior so we have to be careful what we do with him all that to get to the point there's a lot of work to do here i have a very little time to do it but i'm going to ask you to go with me now and read matthew 26 verse 36 to 46 then jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And talking with him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for a second time, he went and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Please bow your head with me. Father, aid your servants this morning. The complexity of what we look at. We must confess 
rather quickly. Father, it's over our head. But you and the grace that is the Holy Spirit that you give to all that believe can open to us our understanding as much as is necessary to be determined by you, not ourselves. We might wish for more, and yet we shall receive only that which you desire. And it will be more than we can truly comprehend. We shall never come to an end of the knowledge of you, but always be arriving at new knowledge, even in the eternity that awaits us. So Father, as we look now, we confess our weakness and ask that the glorious one would show himself to us now through your word and through the indwelling spirit that now resides here in the midst of Christian worship. Pray God's blessing and mercy upon us that as your people, would we not only reside in your presence, but Father, to walk in it plainly always. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want to deal with a, a little bit of verse 38. There are people today that tell you that once you're in the Christian faith, there's no reason for sorrow. When people say that, I just assume they don't understand anything about Jesus, who is the confession by Isaiah, the suffering servant, a person acquainted with your sorrows, says the Bible. So when, when he says, my soul is sorrowful, even to death, he's not being a diva. He's not being a drama queen. What he's being is honest. He is sorrowful unto death. I've been helping a friend, Michelle's and mine. She, she lives in Arizona with her husband. She has children in Ohio. She got news Friday that there may have been a problem. She found out yesterday news that will, as I understand it, give her a means for sorrow throughout the rest of her sojourning. Her 20-year-old son has taken his own life. As I, as I sought to minister to her, I, didn't, I did not try to minister to her in a way that said, well, look, God is good. There's no such thing as sorrow. There's no such thing as suffering in this world. Not only would that have been dull-witted, it would have been less than kind. It would have been a hurtful, mean and just blatantly stupid thing to do. I, I confessed to her God's goodness and said, you know, we don't know. In fact, what we know is so small. Hold on to him who knows all things. Our understanding, our understanding is just in part, and that's the best we can hope for. This world is filled with sorrow and suffering. If you look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus, imagine being a sinless man, now that's a really, that's a great deal of work for you and I to do because you've never been sinless. I've never been sinless. Not for a blink. Not for, for any portion of my life have I been a sinless individual. Imagine being a man whose aspirations are always to please the Father. Always. Not just a few moments on Sunday. Not just a couple minutes through the week. Every single second of his life. His first thought, they call it the beatific vision. He's in the presence of the Father in a way that is so glorious, that is reserved for you and I in eternity, by the way. We shall see him as he is. That's the great promise of the scriptures. Not only that he will come back for us, that, but when he comes back for us, that he will bring us into his presence in a way that is, is like what Christ enjoys. But that beatific vision, that beatific opportunity that Christ walks in, doesn't free him of the agitation of walking around a bunch of sinners, of walking in a world where, you know, one of the questions you might ask yourself, how many of you have ever had a headache? Yeah. You think Jesus had a headache? Now, there's some that would say, oh, no, he couldn't have had a headache. That's just part of sin and suffering. He entered into a world that's swallowed up in sin and suffering. I think he probably had a headache. He, he may have stubbed his toe occasionally. He may have done something else like that. Now, we understand the source of sickness and death are in fact sin. That doesn't mean that every time you cut yourself, hurt yourself, that there's some sin attributed to it. It means the world into which you were born is one that is dying in sin. And it has been since, since Adam transgressed the commandment of God. 
It has been cursed of God because of the disobedience of our father. There is original sin, and then there's a sin that you and I actually commit. Original sin is the condition into which you were born in this world. You're born a sinner. You don't become one. You were born one. You were a sinner in the womb. And yet Jesus was not like that. He is born of a virgin, which makes no sense unless you allow and permit for the Holy Spirit to do his work and make in the womb of, Je uh, of, of Mary a man born into the world who does not have a sin nature. And that that person, perfect, walking around amongst the rest of us, would have felt constant suffering and sorrow. Men whose minds are not fixed on the things of God. Even the best of us aren't fixed on the things of God continuously. Right? Even the apostles. The apostles oftentimes give me great, give me great sense of hope. Because I look at them and they, they, they ask sometimes some of the dopiest questions. I'm going, oh, there's hope for you and me. Because look at the question those guys asked. And they got to walk around with him for years. There, there's hope for you and me. There are people today that say things about Jesus that, well, he, he never really suffered. He never really sorrowed. Well, his testimony is different from that. His testimony is, now this is his human nature speaking, right? He has a real humanity. Don't, don't rob him of that. Don't rob you of that. And don't rob the church of that. So, so when he says plainly, my soul is sorrowful even to death, It's as though the bottom has dropped out of his life. Now, this sorrow is not a sorrow at his death. He's not afraid of death, not for a moment. I don't think that he wavers there one iota. He is not wavering against the idea of dying. In fact, he says, I've come to die. It's his purpose to die. Now, it's also his purpose to live faithfully because if he doesn't live faithfully up to his death, then you and I, again, don't have a righteousness that that redeems us and brings us to heaven. We don't have that. But because he does do that, we do have that. So he's not fearful of death at all. And in fact, what he's fearful of is, is, is very plainly. When the question is stated the second time, this cup, what cup? The cup of my father's wrath, which is not his to drink, it's yours. He takes your cup. The cup of God's wrath against those who have sinned. And yes, that encompasses every single one of us. The cup that you should take. The cup of God's wrath against unholiness, against sin, against wickedness, against those things never should have been done and those things that were never done that should have been. That wrath, which is rightly yours and mine, that wrath which if poured out on us is actually a good thing in the sense that God is right to do so. God never wrongs anyone. When people are judged by God and he pours out their wrath on them because they refuse his son, and those are the only choices, by the way, faith and trust in Christ, which redeems me from the wrath of God, that's the thing you need to be redeemed from. The one who redeems you is the one you have to be redeemed from. It's God's wrath against our sin and iniquities. Jesus picks up your cup, my cup, and he drains it takes upon himself the wrath of God. This one who is in perfect union communion with his father, and again, it's his human nature. This one who walks around in, in, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. No more the Holy Spirit than you have. It's just that there's no sin and iniquity that gets in the way. He's not grieving the Holy Spirit at any point. He's walking around in the power of the Holy Spirit continuously. This one is grieving. And don't take it away from him. Don't make it something less than that. Well, he's just, he's just mocking the suffering. He's just mocking sorrow so that he can give us a nice illustration of, of what it's like. No, he's not. He is sorrowful unto death, and if he's not, he's a liar. This is the human experience with all the weight of sin coming down on it. But in his unique case, none of his. All of yours. And that sin is pressing down on him. And in his, in his humanity, he cries out to his father. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet you see his ready obedience. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I think he knows. 
And yet the anxiety, yes, Jesus t- speaks to us about anxiety constantly. Be anxious for nothing. Right? Just continue praying. Look to God and his providence. By the way, that's a forgotten doctrine in our day. God's providence. God's governance. God's care for his creation. Two sparrows are worth a penny. You are worth many sparrows. That's Jesus' teaching on on, on the believing community. Is that you are never outside your father's care. And that every single moment of your life, despite the fact that you may have, and please join in prayer. I'm not going to give their names out because the camera's on now with that couple who received news yesterday that their young son had taken his own life. I don't know how you get through that, except that you would cling desperately. And yet I find that the Christian life is one of clinging desperately at every single moment, not because you received a phone call that delivered such terrible, sorrowful news, but because you live in a world that is much like the world that Jesus entered into. You may not have a garden of Gethsemane, but you will have a time of suffering and sorrow. You may not pour forth great drops of blood where the capillaries are breaking down and you're passing blood in a way that's not supposed to. That's anxiety. Jesus looking at at the burden of your sin, your iniquity, and the loss of the fellowship that he's going to suffer with his father, which had been perfect. Perfect fellowship with the father, broken because of you, because of me. That's his anxiety. He's never known anything less than the perfect presence and communion and union with his father. And that will be broken. Not because of anything he does in the way of sin, but because of what he does in in the taking on of your and my sin. And Jesus goes to from the most blessed to be to being cursed by God, right? God curses him for your sake. He receives your curses. And he becomes the most cursed man because God, in his wrath, pouring out and Jesus receiving it. And in fact, here's the strange testimony of Isaiah. That seeing the pouring out of his soul, the travail, if you will, he is satisfied. That wouldn't be the word that would come to mind if it were me. If I thought about somebody pouring out the wrath of God For the sake of someone else, I don't think satisfied is the word that would come to mind. I might first, if not thinking carefully, say, well, that's unjust. That's not true. God is free to do whatever he wants. And if he chooses to pour out his wrath on his suffering servant, which is his son, he can do that. And if his son is sinless, the Bible says Jesus is. And he has that wrath poured out, and he gladly receives that. In fact, dies, because the wages of sin is not injury, but death. Dies in your stead, then God cannot rightly or truly, if he is good, if he is God at all, then pour out that same wrath on you. To do so would be to to require a second payment on the same penalty, for the same penalty, really. He can't do that and and remain righteous. So in this garden, you have a man, a very man of very man, who is suffering because he sees the wrath, he sees the cost of that wrath is a separation. And in that is something that he's not ready to give up. And you understand that, I hope. Here he is in perfect felicity with God. By the way, those that leave this world in in Christ have perfect felicity with God. They're they're, they're in perfect joy with God. They're, they're, They're enjoying the presence of God in a way that you and I can't now do. Jesus is experiencing that there, and he's willing to have that torn away from him for you. Don't let that go past. The thing for which you and I yearn is taken away from Jesus because of you, because of me. So when he says, I am, I am sorrowful unto death, it's exactly what he means. And he takes his three friends, Peter, James, and John. And he doesn't say, pray with me. He's not doing that. This is something he's got to do all by himself. Just stay close, man. I am, I am suffering. I am in such sorrow that I could die. Can you just, because he leaves the rest and he brings these three. And the four of them go a little further. 
And he takes those three and says, now you, you guys just stay close with me. I don't want to be alone right now. You've been there, right? You've been there where you said, I, I don't think I can be alone right now. I don't need you to be right on top of me. I don't need you to have a lot of conversations. I, I, I don't need you to pray with me right now. I just need to know that I am not alone in this world. And then he goes a little further and he falls down. He prostrates himself before his father. He says, Father, please, if there is any other way than that you should make me the object of your wrath, if there's any other way, and it's more a crying out, because I think he's convinced in his, in his soul, I've got to do it. For the joy of what I will redeem, I will suffer. So when they call him the suffering servant, it means he's suffering so that you can be the called out of God. If he doesn't suffer, then you can't be called out. It is, it is an absolute necessity that he suffer. If he doesn't suffer, there's no redemption. If there's no sorrow, there's no humanity. If his humanity is a veil, it, 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 the, the Gnostics, the, the, the Docetists, the, the other heretical views, if they're right, you and I don't have a gospel. We don't have good news. But since they are, in fact, wrong, and in fact, God did tabernacle amongst us, and that God is sorrowful in his human nature, not in his divine nature, by the way. That's one of those things that we can, we can argue about, and there's, there's a big debate going on about that, and it will, it will rage on until eternity. Only when time passes away will that, that debate finally be settled. And some of us are going to be pointing fingers at the other ones. See, told you. Yeah. Right? But it'll be done in a, in a good way, I hope. Or at least it could only be that, really. So Jesus' soul is sorrowful unto death. What about his asking? What about this question? My father, you see the respect and the love, right? My father. This is the way he teaches you and me to pray. It's a, it's a new thing. You don't see it in the Old Testament. Not in the way that you see it here. It implies and, and, and expresses a relationship of the deepest sort. My Father. If it is possible. Right? Human nature doesn't know everything. Right? Jesus, when he was introduced to people, he didn't say, oh yeah, I know your name. Right? He had to be introduced to people. He did not, he was not omniscient in his human nature. Divine nature always is. Always knows everything. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Again, not the death, not the burial, not the resurrection, not the ascension, none of those things. I don't think I can do this without you. I don't think in my humanity that I can suffer not knowing you as I now know you. I don't know if I can live this way, separated from you. The anxiety of that is the overwhelming. So when he's asking, his human nature is asking his divine nature, asking his Father, asking the Holy Spirit, if there's any way. Right, again, human nature has limited understanding, limited knowledge. If there's any way, can we do that? The answer is no. There's no other way. And that's an amazing thing for me because when I look at the world, their biggest problem with Jesus is, why is there only one way? Wrong question. Why any way at all? Why should a God who is perfect allow you and me ever to be in his presence? Doesn't have to, but he wants to. And he makes a way. So the right question is, Instead of why isn't there more than one way, is why is there only why why is there one way at all? Why is a holy God opening up the way to Him, to you and me? Doesn't have to, and it would be altogether righteous if He didn't, but He chooses to. So, when this suffering servant is asking, it's a real question based upon the limited knowledge of a human being. His divine nature is fully, fully aware of everything. If there's anything at all we can do, 
This is why he's so sorrowful. This is why he's suffering. Well, now, now I want you to take a look. We're going to move from that, and I've got to do it in rather quick fashion. Look at his friends. These three, Peter, James, and John. You know, he earlier said, look, just stay here, guys, and let me go over there. I'm going to go speak to my father. And I want you close because the hour where I'm going to have to be completely and utterly alone in the, in the world is coming upon me. And I'm just not ready for it yet. Please stay close with me. And he goes back. And there they are snoring. Can't you just stay with me for a little while, guys? And, and, and he, he points to the weakness of the flesh, right? And he came to the disciples. This is verse 40. He came to the disciples and found him sleeping. He said to Peter, why Peter? Not because he's a pope, because there are no popes in the Christian church. It's not that. So could you not watch with me one hour? He didn't mean 60 minutes, by the way. What he's talking about is, can't you just stay with me for a little bit, Peter? Couldn't you stay awake? It's because Peter is the oldest. He, he's, he's, he's somebody who he's going to count on after he's left to, to minister to those around. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. That, that's a big phrase. We're not going to have the time to take care of that today. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We've all seen this, haven't we? I'm going to pray for a certain amount of time. And you wake up and go, Wow, I've been out for a while, right? Now, maybe that's just me and not you. Maybe you're more spiritual, and you never, you never put yourself to prayer and wake up and go, wow, how long have I been out? I think that's happened to all of us. We go into prayer, and we close our eyes, and all of a sudden we find we're praying, we're mumbling, we're snoozing. It happens. It's the weakness of the flesh. You and I... Here, here's a strange thing. The, the worldviews that are opposing the biblical one are one of the, one of the chief ones that is still infecting the church greatly is what's called materialism. If I can see it, touch it, smell it, I think it's real. Well, it's, it probably is. I mean, it could be an illusion. But also those things you can't see, touch, or smell are just as real. Because you can't see, touch, or smell God, and yet he creates all things seen. Therefore, being the cause of all things is greater than the things that he causes, right? Because you can't see, touch, or smell, it doesn't make something not real. But in what he makes, you and me, part of the created order, he makes you to dwell in a flesh that is weak. Now, that's purposeful by, by the design of God, because you weren't meant to dwell in this weakness forever. One of the great joys is that you and I, we will have a body in eternity, by the way. But it will be one like this one, but not exactly like it. Because now you need to go to sleep regularly. You're unaware of what's going on. It's given to things that in eternity you won't be given to doesn't mean you're going to be divine. It doesn't mean you're going to take on God's nature. It means that many of the limitations that now haunt us are taken away. The sin and sorrow left behind. But what Jesus does, these, these close friends, and they, I, I don't think they sought out to say, the minute Jesus got around the corner, he's, he's, he's gone, guys, let's go. I don't think that was it. I think they were desperately sitting there, and they were tired. They'd been up for days, and they're, they're, they're trying to do that thing that we all do, right? Some of you have been in your cars, you, you know, you've worked too long, you're trying to drive home, and you you're sticking your head out the window, look like the dog driving down the road. You're trying desperately to stay awake, right? You get that wind-blown hair look and all that. And you're trying to, and these guys are doing that. They're tired. They're sitting there. And good friend of mine, after a 16-hour day, wrecked his car two driveways away. Two driveways away. Could see his house. Totaled his car. These guys are the inner circle of the inner circle, if you will. They want desperately to be there for Jesus. And yet the weakness of the flesh makes itself known. They fall asleep when Jesus needs them. When he's most desperate, he comes back and finds them asleep. Now, I want to comfort you at this, that this weakness is a weakness designed on us, that we might call out and ask for the one who has all strength. Paul cries out three times, Lord, take this away. Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. 
So that weakness is by design because he wants you that way so that you might plead for him. Because he wants your relational. The re, he wants the relationship to be what he wants it to be. Well, Jesus finally comes back. Look at verse 45. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. He's been praying because of what's coming. And he knows it's there. He feels it. He senses it. He, he, he's, a, he's aware of what, what's, what's rolling up the, the street right at that moment. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man, his favorite title for himself, is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's going to be betrayed in the hands of any men, and they're going to have to be sinners because we're all sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, this is a bit of the attitude of Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, right? His face is fixed like a flint. There's somewhere else, and yet it seems as though he's got one eye on, it's always up to Jerusalem, by the way. One eye fixed on Jerusalem. There, he's ministering, and yet he's fixed on Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where I got to die. He's fixed on, I've got to do this work. He goes into this garden of Gethsemane. He prays. He sweats great drops of blood. He suffers, and he sorrows, and it's real, and it's true. Don't take that away from him, because you can't afford it. You can't afford to have a Jesus that doesn't do this. Because the best time to get yourself ready for the suffering and sorrow is not in the moment. When that doctor gives you a diagnostic that you didn't want to hear, you can't start praying then. And you can, but it's a really bad plan. Your body was not made forever. We are, we are given a body in which to dwell temporarily. And that it lays down at some point. But the promise of God is that when it lays down, you will be more alive in the presence of God than ever you were. That you leave life to, speak, to step into eternal life, to step in the abundance of the presence of God. And that you leave behind, not just limits, because I don't want to squeeze back into that Greek model that I'm trying to defy desperately. But that you leave behind a good life for a greater life, to be in God's presence continuously. That weakness that you and I possess is part of the plan of God to have you call out to him. That weakness is part of God's prescription. <clears throat> because if we were completely self-sufficient, we would have no need of him. And yet your need of him is forever there. And the time to plan for sorrow is in the up. You prepare your soul then. Lord, thank you for the delighting and all the things that you've given me. Lord, for the, for the blessings you've given me. It's amazing how we can count the blessings when it's easy. And yet we receive that phone call, that news, that text. And all of a sudden it seems like I can't find even two blessings to count at the moment. Suffering is part of life. The world that you have been entered into, the world that you were born into, is one filled with tumult. This last year has been a weird one. It's been really no weirder than the average. People are strange. Now, some of you have drifted off of that old song, right? We'll come back. Yes, they're strange. The world is strange. And yet God is good. God will never forsake you. God has become incarnate to bear your sins upon the tree that you might never have to bear them. And what he says, it's a funny thing the Bible does. It's as though God takes your sins and he puts them back here and he says, we're not going to talk about that anymore. It's not that he doesn't know them because he's all-knowing. What he says is, I'm not going to remember these to you anymore. It's as though they never were. Let's now walk in the perfection of this relationship that Jesus secured for you. All right, what a blessing that is. And yet it doesn't come without suffering, both his and yours. In this world, you will suffer, says Jesus. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, count yourself to be amongst the most blessed of the world. That's the truth. I didn't iron out all the mystery of this passage because if I were given from now until a thousand years from now, we would have just about the same amount of mystery that I have now. But in that mystery of the incarnation of God, we have the suffering of Christ that takes away your suffering, your sorrow, your curse. 
because he knew no sin became a curse for you. Became accursed for you. And the reason he's done it is because in the, in the pouring out or the travail of his soul, he is satisfied to purchase you, to make you his own, and to give you as a gift from him to his father. Lord, I have purchased these. Father, these are mine. I have, I have bought them with my blood. Well, let me ask you to bow your head. Father, help us. The things of mystery are not yet ironed out. The wrinkles in the fabric of our understanding will always be there, even in eternity. You have made known to us mysteries too great, too high. And yet, Lord, I believe our souls are meant to wrestle with them, to be intrigued by truth that is greater than my whole existence. I pray, God, your blessing now upon your people. I pray, Father, that you will bless those who are born again with the affirmation, as the Scripture speaks of, of the indwelling of the Spirit that is theirs because of their faith in Christ. And I pray for any that might not know Christ, Lord, that they might today, though weak as they are, cry out for the strength that is everlasting, the strength that is ours through Jesus. It is but one call away. They can cry out for Christ now and then know him everlastingly, be given everlasting life in a moment. We ask God blessing and mercy. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Pat, would you just miss his brother?